And the problem says a magazine reports that teenagers make on average at least four phone calls per night. The school principal in a city thinks that the magazine's wrong. So he tests and samples 25 teens and he gets an average of 3.4 calls per night for those people that he asked with a standard deviation of 0.9 calls. Test the principal's claim at a 99% confidence level. All right, so we need to write down the null hypothesis, the uh, alternate hypothesis, and then we need to write down all of the data associated with the sampling that was done. And then we need to go and calculate the test statistics, see if it's in the rejection region, and then decide if this hypothesis that the principal is putting forth should be uh, uh, considered or not. All right, so basically for this particular case, if you read the problem, it says a magazine reports teenagers make on average at least four phone calls per night. So that's going to be the null hypothesis. It's a mean because we're talking about a number, uh, a number of phone calls in this case. And it's saying that it's greater than or equal to four calls per night. So it doesn't say greater than or equal to, it just says at least four calls. That means four or greater. Now, the principal, all it says about him is it says the principal thinks the magazine's wrong. And you need to know that if this is the null hypothesis, the alternate hypothesis has to be the mathematical opposite of that. So if this is greater than or equal to four calls, then the principal must be thinking that they're making less than. So in other words, 3.8 calls, 3.9 calls, 3.95 calls, and all the way up in, until, but not including four calls, that's what the principal's alternate hypothesis or research hypothesis is putting forth. Now, because we have a left-hand uh, arrow here, this is going to be a left tail test. A left hand or a left tail test. Okay. Now the next thing we need to do is write down everything else that the problem gives us. You want to do all of this kind of before you do any calculations. Now it says that to test this, he samples 25 teenagers, so that means n is 25, 25 samples. And he says the answers he gets back from this data set, x bar, is 3.4 calls. That's an average of the samples that he got back. And it has a sample standard deviation of 0 0.9 calls. All right. Now, at a glance, you might look at this and say, well, the null hypothesis is saying greater than or equal to four calls. The sample data is telling us 3.4 calls, so if you just look at it casually, you might say, well, the null hypothesis must be rejected. Well, you don't know because you got to take into account the sample standard deviation and how many people you asked, and also how far away that is from the mean, which is, or in this case, the null hypothesis, which is four. All of those things are important to figure out if it's statistically significant. Having one or two decimal places um, different from four is not enough to be statistically significant. It has to be far enough away with enough samples and with a tight enough standard deviation to actually be what we call statistically significant. Now the last thing we want to write as far as our data from the problem is we want to say, uh, in this case it says we're doing the claim at a 99% level of confidence. So you write level of confidence, 99%. And you need to know, since you've done enough of these problems, the variable C is 0.99. That's what this means. And so because of that, alpha is 0.01, 1 minus C. These guys have to always add up to 1. So you know what alpha is. The reason we have to find alpha is because that's what we're going to put as a shaded region in our distribution. It's always in terms of alpha, which is the level of significance. All right, so the next thing we need to do is draw a picture. Always want to draw a picture of where we're at here. So it's a T distribution. We're going to be using a T distribution because it's dealing with the mean of something and the sample size is less than 30. So we can draw a bell-shaped looking distribution. It's not normal, but it looks at a glance to be normal. And the higher the samples that you have, the closer and closer this T distribution does actually look normal. So we'll put a T down here to re remind ourselves that this is actually a, a T distribution. Now this is a left tail test. So what this means is the center of the distribution for T distribution is always zero. It's a symmetrical distribution, just like a normal distribution. But since it's a left tail test, over in the left hand tail, we just kind of grab a little region here and shade it. This shaded region has got to be what? Well, it's got to be alpha. And we know from this uh, problem that alpha is 0.01. So what it basically means is this shaded region over here is equal to 0 0.01. And the value of t that corresponds to this area over here 
if it were over here, we would call it t sub alpha, but since we know these are negative values, we put a negative sign in front to remind us that these are all negative values of t, just like these are all positive values of t. So what we've done is we've drawn a picture graphically without any of this business trying to show us what we're doing. This over here, if we get anywhere over to the left here into the shaded region, we will be rejecting the null hypothesis. And anything over here, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. So just to remind you of that, I'll draw a dotted line over here. And then here I'll say we reject H naught anywhere in this region over here. And anywhere over here, we fail to reject H naught. All right, so now we're in a position to actually figure out what this threshold value is that's going to determine our rejection regions. All right, and so what we want to do is that. So the first thing we want to find is the degree of freedom, right? And we know that that's just the sample size minus 1. In this case, the sample size is 25 minus 1, so the degrees of freedom is 24. So this is a 24 degree of free problem, degree of freedom problem. And we know that the shaded area here is 0 .01, 0 .01. So what we have to do is go to the back of the book, to the back of whatever book you're using, there's a T distribution. And what you want to do is go down to 24 degrees of freedom. Now when you get up into high number of degrees of freedom, you might not see 24 there in your table. It might show 25, it might skip, start skipping by fives. So you just find the entry that's closest to 24. So that locks down your row in your chart. And then you gotta go over and scan for that column. Now what would you be looking for? Alpha in this case is 0.01, that's the shaded region. So you wanna go and look for 0.01. So what you do is you, in the top row you look for an alpha 0.01, then you go down to 24 degrees of freedom and you're going to get a number off of that. And uh, what number you're going to get, let me just write it down explicitly. I'll put T uh, sub alpha, T, which would be T sub 0 0.01, because alpha is 0 0.01, at 24 degrees of freedom. When you look that up in the chart, when you go to the find the alpha up here in the top row and then go down 24 degrees of freedom, what you actually get is positive 2.49. Now here is where you have to be very conscious of exactly what you're doing. If you just blindly follow stuff, you might end up getting the wrong answer or get yourself confused. You have to remember that T distributions for the table in the back of your book, they're almost always written, and you should check your particular table, for the area to the right. In other words, in this problem, we're carry, we care about the area to the left. We care about this value of t over here. But when you look at the chart, you, you don't actually deal with this over here. The chart in the back is a shaded region in the right-hand tail and a t sub alpha over there. It's the area to the right. So what we get when we look up 24 degrees of freedom at an alpha of 0.01 is it's giving us the value of t alpha over here. It's giving us 2.49 over here. That would give us a shaded region of 0.01. So if this were a right tail test, this would be the value we would use, 2.49. But it's not a right tail test. It's a left tail test. So how do you get this value of t? Well, this is a mirror image, right? Literally, you can fold it in half. This area is the same as it would be if we were doing a right tail test. So what you do is you just stick a negative here. So you say negative T sub alpha, negative 2.49. So the bottom line is this value that you care about is negative 2.49. You have to have the negative there, because if you don't, you're gonna get yourself confused. The way that you double check that you've done everything right is you look back at your picture and you say, hey, the center is zero, all values of t should be negative over here, all values of t should be positive over here, so you expect a negative value. You always have to, to do that, and that's one reason why I encourage everybody to draw a picture, because I can see from a picture clearly negative positive, because I, I, I know what the distribution is supposed to look like, and so I'll never forget this. If I don't draw this picture at all, I could easily just use this positive value by accident and get myself really confused. Um, so draw your picture. When you look this up, keep in mind that the table is written for the right-hand area, so you get a positive value back, you stick a negative to get this value. All right, now we have our uh, rejection regions in place. Now before we do anything else, I want to kind of to tell you that as you start to do enough of these problems and do them over and over again, when you draw a picture like this, even though it says zero here, you can start to kind of visualize the center of the distribution as almost being like your null hypothesis, right? You can kind of think of it as being four, right? And what you're testing is that mu is less than four. So the value that we got from our sampling was less than four. So we expect 
the T value that we calculate to be less somewhere over here to the left because the data that we got was indeed less than four. So you need to visualize the peak of this distribution almost as, as the null hypothesis here. And our data here is going to give us T values that are to the left of it because if this were in fact four and then the data gives us 3.4, it's gonna be over here. But the question is, is the sample size high enough and the sample standard deviation low enough and the discrepancy between this and the null hypothesis big enough to push this value of t that we calculate so far to the left over the rejection region so that we get what we call statistical significance. You can take samples of people and get all kinds of answers which may or may not agree with your little hypothesis, but that doesn't matter in statistics. What you wanna do is ask enough people to give you enough consistent data, that's what a standard deviation is, consistency in your data, right? And also in the direction that you want, right? In this case, the alternate hypothesis is saying uh, that the uh, number of calls is gonna be less than four. That's why it's a left tail test. All right. If the if it were flipped around to be greater than four, we'd be doing a right tail test. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is, before you do any calculations, you draw this, you draw your rejection region, you can visualize this as being almost like the null hypothesis. This is what we accept to be true. Our data is less than four, so we expect to get a value of t over here. The question is, is it going to be far enough over here to trip us into the rejection region and be what we call statistically significant? That's the question. The answer to that question, we have to do a calculation and calculate the test statistic, which is x bar minus mu over s over square root of n. And we've talked about this many times. The data that we got from our surveying was 3.4, average value of 3.4 calls per night. And this comes from the null hypothesis, which is just four, okay? And then over here, uh, S, which is the standard deviation, 0.9, and square root of N, in this case we did 25 calls, so it's 25. All right, that's what we're working with. And in the top, 3.4 minus four, Notice right away, 3.4 minus 4 is going to give me a negative value. So no matter what the bottom is of this fraction, t is negative. And that's exactly what we said. We said, hey, this was lower than 4, so if this represents almost the null hypothesis, then we expect to be somewhere, at least over here, negative values of t. You can see from the way this is set up, x bar minus the null hypothesis, because this is smaller, it guarantees a negative value of t. So we know we're going to be in that direction. That's why we're doing a left tail test. But the question is, are we going to be far enough over there to trip us into what we call statistical significance, where we're confident uh, in, in our answer? All right, so 3.4 minus 4, we get negative 0.6 on the numerator. Notice the negative we just talked about. And then the bottom, we have 0.9, and the square root of 25, of course, you all know, is 5. So on the top, we have negative 0.6. And when we take the 0.9 divided by 5, we get 0 0.18. And I'll switch colors over here to green. So the test statistic that we've calculated, negative 0.6 divided by 0.18, we get negative 3.33. Notice it's negative. The negative came about because the sample data that we got was less than the mean. That's in the direction that, we're, that we wanted. If we were putting forth this hypothesis, that's what we expect to get. That's what we hope to get anyway if we're doing this test. So negative 3.33, where does this fall? Well, here is negative 2.49. Negative 3.33 is somewhere over here. So I'll say t is equal to negative 3.33. So the test statistic, not only was it in the correct direction, but it was so far in the direction that it tripped us over into our rejection region here. And so we say that we can reject the null hypothesis at this alpha at this level of significance, level of confidence, whatever you want to say. And that, that's basically what we're doing. Now notice in this case, the level of significance 0.01 is a level of confidence of 99%. So in this case, we are very, very confident that the uh, null hypothesis should be rejected. The null hypothesis is saying that kids are making more than four or equal to four calls per night. Our research hypothesis is saying that they're making on average less than four per night. 
You cannot deduce that this is the case just because 3.4 is less than 4. You can't. What makes it the case is that not only is it pretty far lower than 4, but we did ask a good number of people and the standard deviation was pretty small. 0.9, that's almost one phone call, plus or minus almost one phone call of the standard deviation. That means that of all the 25 kids we asked, their data was pretty tightly packed around that mean. So we have a high confidence that that mean that we got from sampling those kids was representative of the larger population. Well, you're not always sure, you're never sure, but if you get consistent answers from all of these different people, then you're pretty sure that it's representative of the larger population. So because of that, we push it through and we get a t-value that's highly negative, trips us into our rejection region. So the evidence supports the claim that the teens make less than four calls per night at this level of significance. And of course, at this level of significance is pretty darn high, 99%. That's about as high as you're going to see. Uh, even in real life. So make sure you understand the concept here. I want you to start visualizing when you draw it. I want you to start visualizing the center as being the null hypothesis, right? And then I want you to start thinking as you're, as you're looking at your test statistic that you calculate, you're going to go either one way or the other, but how far you go in that direction is going to be dependent upon how far from the, the, the null hypothesis your data is in conjunction with your standard deviation in that. Because visualizing that can really help you. We're going to get into another concept in a few lessons later called p-values, which you'll be learning about. And it's, it's almost exactly the same thing as what we're doing now, but when you understand the concept of this kind of being your null hypothesis, sort of, in the center, and as you get data to the left, you're just going farther and farther. You get more and more extreme data with good confidence, and then you pop yourself over into the rejection region. If you can kind of visualize that, then you're going to be in good shape when we get to the future topic. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind, and I'll remind you as we go forward. Make sure you can do this. We have yet another problem to do here. I want to make sure you're totally confident with hypothesis testing, so follow me on to the next section, and we'll tackle that right now. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.